It was always my understanding that when a church books a guest speaker, that is normally customary to tell the guest speaker that they're <laughs> booked to, to speak at the church, you know, so, but um, anyway, I'm here now and it's great to be here as always. Thank you very much for inviting me back. Please open your Bibles to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. So there's a reason why I've chosen John chapter 10 for you today, because uh, not only is it Advent, but tonight at sundown begins something else. It begins the Feast of Hanukkah. Hanukkah begins tonight. And this is what's taking place here in John chapter 10. Also at Hanukkah, we light candles as well. So it's John chapter 10 from verse 22. John chapter 10, verses 22 to 42. Now it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem. And it was winter and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him to say to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, but you do not believe. The works that I do in my father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works have I shown you from my Father. For which of these do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, for a good work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him who the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I, do not, if I do not do the works of my father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the father is in me and I in him. Therefore, they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. So again, it begins by telling us what time of year this takes place. It's taking place at the Feast of Dedication. That's what is known as the Feast of Hanukkah. It's also known as the Festival of Lights as well. You may have heard it called that. The Feast of Dedication, this is Hanukkah, which begins tonight. And this is the time of year it's taking place. Now, during the first Hanukkah, we're talking about 160 years before Jesus came. So not too long. What God is doing at this period in history is that he's preparing the way for the Messiah to come. Had the events of Hanukkah not happened, the Messiah could not have been born and the Messiah could not have fulfilled the law on our behalf. Because at this time in history, the Israelites were under this oppression, this dictatorship by the Greek Empire. The Greeks, the Seleucid Greek Empire, under a king by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. Very, very wicked people. Very, very wicked man. He sought to completely eliminate Judaism from Israel. He banned all Jewish practice, circumcision, observance of the Sabbath, study of Torah. And more importantly, the forbidding of the sacrifices at the temple. This king wanted to completely eradicate this from the land of Israel. Of course, there was mass persecution. Anyone who didn't conform was put to death. And what this King Antiochus does is he goes to the temple. He enters the Holy of Holies. Now, do you remember I spoke to you not so long ago about the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur? Only the high priest could ever enter the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement to make sacrifice for the Jewish people. Anything other than this was an abomination in the eyes of the Lord. Only the high priest could ever enter the Holy of Holies. So what this King Antiochus does is he enters the Holy of Holies and he sets up this image to the Greek god Zeus. He sets up an image to the Greek god Zeus. And what he does is he gives this image his own features to make himself God. That's what these tyrants used to do. They used to deify themselves and demand that they be worshipped. And of course, as I said, anyone who didn't conform to this, anyone who didn't conform to the Greek system of worship, the Greek style of religion, they were put to death. But as the Bible says, God always has his faithful remnant. God always has his preserved faithful remnant, the 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to bow. And therefore, God raises up this remnant of loyal Jews known as the Maccabees. It was, it was Judas Maccabeus who was their leader. Maccabeus in, in, um, 
it's the Hellenization of the of the Hebrew word for a hammer, like a sledgehammer, a big hammer. So this is this guy's nickname. This guy is like a tough guy. He's got this reputation and his nickname is the sledgehammer. So he's the leader of this group of Jewish rebels. And of course, they fight against this Greek army and against all odds. And of course, with God on their side, they overcome the Greeks and defeat their Greek oppressors. And then, of course, after this victory, after this miraculous victory, came the rededication of the Holy Temple. And that is what Hanukkah celebrates, is the rededication of the Holy Temple. Because it had been defiled by the Greeks. It had been defiled by Antiochus when he set up this abomination in the temple. And of course, many of you must know the story where it came to the lighting of the menorah. The menorah in the temple represents the light of God. And it came to the lighting of the menorah. However, there was only enough oil for one day. There was only enough oil to last for one day. Now, it takes seven days to prepare the temple oil. The temple oil has to go for a, a purification ritual, which takes seven days. But there was only enough oil for one day. But miraculously, that oil burnt for eight whole days. And that's why Hanukkah is an eight-day festival. It represents the eight days that the oil burnt for. And that's also why it's traditional with Hanukkah to eat food fried in oil. So donuts is a common one. Donuts is a common Hanukkah food, which we eat at Hanukkah. And... Is because of the eight day burning of the oil, which should have only lasted for one day. And that for me was God's confirmation that he was with those Maccabees the whole time when they was overcoming their Greek oppressors. It was God's um, confirmation that he was there leading their way. And of course, what God is doing behind the scenes here, as I said, he's preparing the way for Jesus to be born. He's making preparations for the Messiah to come. Had these events not happened, then the Messiah could not have been born. Now, it's important to understand all of this because A, it's preparing the way for the Messiah to come, which could not have happened, and B, because it's prophesied in the Bible, these events, although it takes place in what's known as the intertestamental period, you've got 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and this takes place in that period. The book of Daniel is very unique in that it prophesies for that time period. There's some fantastic prophecies in the book of Daniel, some very fascinating prophecies, so much so that skeptics say that the book of Daniel was written after they happened. They refused to accept that Daniel wrote these prophecies hundreds of years before they happened because they were fulfilled so accurately with deadly accuracy that they just do not accept that Daniel was written about 530 BC. They say it was written after the events happened, but that's what the skeptics always do. They try and pick apart the Bible, don't they? So that's what God is doing at this period in history here. He's preparing the way for the coming of the Messiah. And of course, earlier in this chapter, it's causing division. There's a division going on, isn't there? People are divided. Some people believe that Jesus, you know, the words he's saying are true. There's others who are saying, no, he has a demon. And then there's other people saying, how can demons open the eyes of the blind? And then, of course, the Pharisees then say, tell us, are you the Messiah? Again, Christ, the Messiah is the same word. Are you the Messiah? Tell us plainly. They don't really want to know the truth. All they're doing is looking to pick an argument with him. They're looking just to argue. And Jesus responds and says, I already told you. I already told you the truth, but you don't believe. And you don't believe. Why? Because you're not of my sheep. That's why he said you don't believe, because you are not of my sheep. I give my sheep eternal life, and they shall never perish. And no one shall snatch them out of my father's hand. Now, two things here. He's referring to God as his father. So already this is getting the people's backs up. He's referring to God as his father. And secondly, this is the passage that a lot of people quote who hold to that idea of eternal security and not losing their salvation. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. Now, a lot of people would argue, but it doesn't say that you can't voluntarily depart from the father's hand yourself. And what I would argue in response to that would be that if that's the case, then they never were in the father's hand to begin with. Now, whatever side of the camp you're on, I would always say that Jesus said, I never knew you. He didn't say, I once knew you. I used to know you. He says, I never knew you. They never were saved to begin with. So this argument here about this once saved, always saved, eternal security. Yes, they point to verses like this. And yes, it does say that it doesn't say that you can't voluntarily step out of the father's hand yourself. Yes, it's true. No one can snatch you out of the father's hand. But I would argue that anyone who steps out of the father's hand never was in the father's hand to begin with. So again, it's really a, a, a debate for another time. 
I did do a sermon on this about a year ago, which is over an hour long. So I'll be more than happy to share that with you if you are interested in that subject. But then in verse 30, he says, I am my father are one. I and my father are one. And this is what then made them pick up them stones to stone him. We are not stoning you for any good work, but for blasphemy because you claim to be God. Now, it's interesting that Muslims always say that Jesus never claimed to be God. This is what they always argue. Jesus never actually claimed to be God. Now, if that's the case, then why are the Jews so disgruntled and why are they picking up stones to stone him and accusing him of blasphemy? Blasphemy because you claim to be God. The Jews here know that he's claiming to be God. So this argument that Jesus never claimed to be God is absolute rubbish. The Jews were stoning him because of these blasphemous claims, which they saw it as. Why did the Jews accuse him? Well, back in, back in verse 22, it told us what time of year this was. Remember, this is taking place at Hanukkah. So don't forget, Hanukkah, this is something Jesus would have celebrated year after year. This is something he'd have grown up celebrating. He'd have known this feast very well. And it says it took place at Solomon's porch. Now, Solomon's porch is the area east of the Temple Mount where they used to gather to celebrate these feasts. All these feasts, they used to gather at Solomon's porch to celebrate them. So Jesus here is celebrating Hanukkah. It's something he'd have celebrated year in, year out. And of course, the Pharisees at this feast of Hanukkah, they've got it in their minds, haven't they? about this tyrant, this tyrant who tried to take over Israel, this tyrant who tried to eliminate Jewish practice from Israel. And that's exactly what they saw Jesus as doing, trying to get rid of the Jewish law, trying to get rid of Jewish practice. This is what they accused him of, wasn't it? So this is why they are so disgruntled and so angry because they've got it in their back of their minds. Oh, here we go again, another tyrant who's claiming to be God. Remember all these tyrants, they had themselves deified and they demand to be worshiped. And that's what they're thinking here. It's taking place at Hanukkah, and it's very significant because that's why they're thinking, here we go again, someone else who's claiming to be God, and that's why they're taking that real, start, that real um, um, staunch stance against him. You are just a man, but you are making yourself God. Now, from verse 34, Jesus responds very cleverly here. I shared an example with you a few weeks ago about how Jesus was so clever in his responses in digging out these examples from the Old Testament, things I never would have thought of in a million years. But it's a response which a lot of people don't really know what to make of. A lot of people have difficulty understanding this response from Jesus in verse 34. He says, is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? And notice with a small g, small g there, I said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, why do you say of him who the father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the son of God. I said, you are gods. Now what that is, that's a quote from the Old Testament that is quoting Psalm 82 verse six. And in the Hebrew there, in the Hebrew text of Psalm 82, the word there is Elohim. Elohim is the word for God. Now, what is Psalm 82 all about? It's the same rule that you apply with anything when you're studying the Bible. When you want to know what someone's talking about, if Jesus quotes the Old Testament, if Paul refers to the Old Testament, what do you do? You go back and look at that Old Testament passage. You go back and look what they're talking about. That's called the co-text. The co-text is the text that that text is referring to. If you isolate the two, then you're free then to apply whichever meaning to it you want. And that's why there's so much false doctrine in the church today, is because they don't take into account the context and the co-text. The co-text is the one that Jesus is talking about here, Psalm 82. It's a direct quote. So that's how you study the Bible. If you don't take into account the co-text, you can apply any meaning you want, but you have to take into account what he's quoting here. So in order to know what Jesus means here, what do you do? You go to Psalm 82. Turn now to Psalm 82 in your Bibles. Psalm 82, and it will tell us exactly what Jesus is referring to. It's not a long psalm. We'll read the whole thing, but it's not a long psalm. It's only seven verses. Mm. Eight, beg your pardon. Psalm 82. Again, this is what Jesus is quoting here. Psalm 82. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you ju judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked selah selah is like a pause the, the meaning of the actual hebrew word is unknown but it's used in the psalms and in the book of habakkuk as well it's kind of like a pause selah defend the poor and fatherless 
do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the poor and needy, free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods. That's what Jesus quoted there, verse six. I said, you are gods and all of you are children of the most high, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit the nations. So again, what does the psalmist mean? This is a psalm of Asaph, I believe. Asaph was one of the magicians in the temple. What does he mean here? He's talking clearly to the judges. This psalm here is addressed to the judges, isn't it? Look at verse two. How long will you judge unjustly? These judges were corrupt, weren't they? So he's talking to the judges here. And again, as I said, I said, you are gods. The word there is Elohim. So it's the same word that you'll see in other Hebrew texts where it says God is Elohim in the Hebrew. And of course, one of the things that this psalm is referring to, again, you need to keep going back, you need to keep going back to the beginning. One of the things that this psalm is referring to is the laws of justice, which is found in Exodus 22. In Exodus 22, it talks about the laws of justice. For example, in verse 9, it says, for any kind of trespass, whether it be, whether it concerns an ox, a donkey, a sheep, or clothing, or for any kind of lost thing which another claims to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges, and whoever the judges condemns shall pay double to his neighbor. Now, what do you reckon the Hebrew word is there for judges in the Hebrew? The actual Hebrew word for judge is shofet, shofet. The Hebrew word for the book of judges is shoftim. It's the same word, shoftim, book of judges. That's the Hebrew word for judge, but it's not the Hebrew word used in this text here. The Hebrew word used in Exodus 22 for judges is Elohim, Elohim, God. Why do they say that judges are like gods with a small g? Don't forget, at the time, judges were responsible for putting people to death. Only up until last century, we still had the death penalty in this country. The judges are basically acting as a god in that they're deciding this person's fate this criminal this criminal who's standing before the judge that judge is deciding that person's fate that judge is almost as a god to that person because it is that judge who's going to decide whether that person gets to live or die that's why in hebrew thought a judge is known as elohim it's a different context again you need to understand what context he's talking about but it's talking about judges as gods and this is what jesus means here when he quotes psalm 82 he refers to judges as gods because don't forget the judge when a criminal stands before the judge that criminal's life is in the judge's hands and of course when a criminal stands before the judge it's a picture of the heavenly scene isn't it because that's what's going to happen to every single person who doesn't know the lord every single one of us is going to appear before the judgment seat of christ and it's going to be just like in a court of law it's a picture of the heavenly scene, isn't it? Now, again, Psalm 82 is written to the judges. The whole context of Psalm 82 is a reminder to those judges that they too one day are going to be standing before the judge with a capital J. They're going to be standing before the supreme judge. Verse 6, I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. And there's going to be a lot of judges in trouble on judgment day, isn't there? A lot of these judges sit in their courtrooms thinking that they are the supreme judge. But when they go to be up there, they are going to stand before the supreme judge and realize that they never were the supreme judge because there is one who judges all men, including these corrupt judges. And of course, we know that there's a lot of corruption in our legal system, isn't there? In America, there was a woman who was a Christian, she was in ministry, but before she was a Christian, I think she was from Los Angeles, before she was a Christian, she used to work in an s and club. So these guys used to come and pay hundreds of dollars to receive this sadistic, perverted treatment from these women. And this woman said, what do you think is the type of client that they receive the most in these s and clubs? And her answer was judges. A lot of these judges are going to these s and clubs to receive this perverted sadistic treatment and then the next day they're going to work putting on their wigs and deciding someone's fate so this is what basically he's talking about this is what psalm 82 means you too are going to die like men and you are going to appear before the judge with a capital j 
So bringing it back to what Jesus is saying now, why is Jesus quoting this? He's pointing out the hypocrisy and the lack of consistency in the Pharisees' arguments. That's why he's alluding to that verse. Again, it's such a clever use of text when you think about it. It's something I never would have thought of in a million years. But he's doing this to point out their lack of consistency. He's saying, if the judges were called gods, with a small g, which doesn't bother you, you're not bothered by that, because it's in your scriptures, then why are you accusing me of blasphemy when I call myself the son of God? That's what, he's, that's what he's getting at. He's pointing out the double standards and the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and their lack of consistency in what they claim to believe. That is why he's going back to Psalm 82, which in turn is referring back to Exodus 22. Again, you need to keep going back to the beginning to figure out what Jesus means here. Some people don't know what to make of this verse, but that's what he means. It's a very difficult verse to uh, understand because it sounds like he's saying there's other gods. And a lot of people use that wrongly out of context. Again, isolating the co-text from the text they're applying whatever meaning to it they want but that's what jesus means so continuing on in john 10 from verse 37 he then goes on to say if i'm not doing the works of my father then don't believe me but i'm i'm doing the work of my father and therefore at least believe the work that's what he's saying you know i am doing the works of my father therefore at least believe the work i am doing and then he says, I and my father are one. And then he, they tried to seize him, but his time hadn't come yet. That's why you see so many times that they tried to seize him, but he slipped away. He says he slipped away into the crowd simply because his time hadn't come yet. So again, they're desperately trying to seize him. They're, de they're desperately trying to get him so they can put him to death. And remember, this is taking place at Hanukkah. It's very significant that he's taking place at the Feast of Dedication because they're thinking back to the last time they had a tyrant who's claiming to be God. Now, why is, it un why is it important to understand about this time of year? Why is it important to understand about this Feast of Hanukkah? Well, A, because God was making preparations for the Messiah to come, and B, because there is still a final tyrant yet to come, isn't there? There is another tyrant who's coming in the last days in the character of Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, as I said, he entered the Holy of Holies. He set up an image to be worshipped. He deified himself. This is exactly what the Antichrist is going to do. Antiochus Epiphanes is a major type of the Antichrist, the foreshadowing of this Antichrist who's coming. All the wicked men in the Bible, whenever you see these wicked men in the Bible, Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, Haman, Herod, Judas, they all foreshadow the Antichrist and they all teach us something about what the Antichrist will be like. And Antiochus Epiphanes is no different. Remember, it was prophesied in the book of Daniel. We won't go too deeply into the book of Daniel. We'll be here all week if we do. But in Daniel 11, Daniel 11 verses 31 to 32, it says his army will take over the temple fortress, pollute the sanctuary, put a stop to the daily sacrifices and set up the abomination of desolation. He will flatter and win over those who have violated the covenant but the people who know their God will be strong and resist him. So this is talking about what Antiochus Epiphanes did and ultimately those Maccabees as well. His army will take over the temple fortress. That's what Antiochus did. Pollute the sanctuary. He sure did that. One thing I forgot to mention is that he sacrificed a pig on the altar. That's what he did. He sacrificed a pig on the altar of sacrifice. So entering the Holy of Holies, sacrificing pigs, can't get more of an abomination of that for the Jewish people. Pollute the sanctuary. He'll put a stop to the daily sacrifices. Again, he outlawed sacrifice, he outlawed Jewish practice and set up the abomination of desolation. That was the image he set up in the temple of Zeus. He will flatter and win over those who have violated the covenant. Again, many Jews turn from Judaism. They abandon Judaism to submit to this tyrant. But the people who know their God will be strong and resist him. That's talking about the Maccabees, those ones who refused to conform to that Greek system of religion. Those Maccabees who were loyal to their God and ultimately, who God gave victory over their oppressors. So, this was prophesied in Daniel, fulfilled by Antiochus and the Maccabees. But now look at what Jesus says in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verses 15 to 18. He was asked about the signs of his coming. He was asked about what will be the signs of the last days. One of the things he says in Matthew 24, verses 15 to 18. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand. 
Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to get anything out of his house. And let him who is on the field in the field not go back to get his clothes. You see that? When you see the, what Daniel spoke about, the abomination of desolation, what he's doing there is he's pointing to something which happened in the past and was fulfilled. And he's saying this same thing is going to happen again. Now, this is how Jewish prophecy works. To a Westerner, we just think that prophecy means prediction and fulfillment prediction and fulfillment that's how prophecy works to a westerner but in judaism that's not how prophecy works prophecy is pattern it's pattern multiple fulfillments it's fulfilled multiple times and it all foreshadows the last one it all foreshadows the final one and it all teaches us something about the final one this is what jesus is telling us here he points to something which happened in the past and he says this exact same thing is going to happen again now that's how we understand what's going to happen in the future that's how we understand prophecy if you want to know what's going to happen in the future what do you do you look at what happened in the past and it's all fulfilled to the letter you can go so deeply into this you can analyze all the prophecies how they were fulfilled and it's going to be fulfilled again to the letter according to the book of revelation look at revelation 13 verses 14 to 16 and he deceives those who dwell on the earth that's the Antichrist. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many who would not worship the image to be killed. Again, it's exactly what happened at the time of the Maccabees. It's exactly what happened at the time of Hanukkah. There's going to be another antichrist there's going to be another abomination of desolation there's going to be another apostasy according to second Thessalonians 2 another mass falling away there's going to be another faithful remnant God always has his faithful remnant there's going to be end time Maccabees there's going to be people in the last days who will refuse to submit to this evil tyranny which is coming there's going to be apostasy and there's going to be Maccabees and my encouragement to you today is just make sure you're one of the Maccabees and not one of the apostates. Amen. Let us finish in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for um, leading us in all truth by your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, for all these wonderful stories and examples which you use to teach us, Lord. We just pray, Heavenly Father, that as these days grow darker and darker, that you would just give us more and more strength and perseverance, Lord. We pray for an extra filling of the Holy Spirit for all of us here today, Lord, that we too can go out and proclaim the good news of Jesus to others in these dark days, that other people may know that they don't have to remain in darkness, they don't have to remain in slavery, but help us, Lord, to convey that message to the world, that they can come out of that darkness and come out of that slavery by putting their faith and trust in your dear Son. Lord, help us to shine the light of Jesus in the darkness. Help us, Lord, to keep on being good ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Lord, we just thank you again for this day. We thank you for bringing this congregation together. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll just give everyone a wonderful week this week, Lord, that everyone here will just know your blessing and your presence with them throughout the week. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.